Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host. Welcome to another episode of the Democracy That Delivers podcast. This special podcast series is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE. Today's session is about a, a, a somber topic. It's exciting, somber, serious, cause for optimism, cause for pessimism, um, kind of depends on, on how you view it. We're talking about Bangladesh today. Bangladesh, uh, this is coming to you in September 2024. Uh, Bangladesh is in the midst of a political crisis, uh, and it's a political crisis that's becoming uh, an economic crisis, uh, a socio-political crisis. We're joined today by two very good friends of Cyprus. Uh, both are with the Center for Governance Studies, or, or CGS, one of the most prominent think tanks and genuinely nonpartisan think tanks. CGS has an ideology, uh, but they're not, they're not partisan. They're not part of one side or the other. They're, they're viewed as a very credible technocratic voice. Our two friends are Shirhat Rana Rushmi and Apun Zahir. I'm not going to read their biographies because that takes a little bit too much time, but their biographies are available in the link. And we only have uh, about 30 minutes for this conversation, and so we're going to jump right in. Um, for a very quick background, 10-second background, uh, the, the genesis of, this, of the crisis in Bangladesh. Uh, in June of this year, the government enacted a controversial policy, basically setting aside a certain percentage of government jobs for descendants of the country's independence war the independence war in, in 1971. The children and grandchildren of the people who fought in that war have a, an inside track to get government jobs. <clears throat> a bit of a ham-handed policy, uh, obvious political implications behind it, and students, uh, university students initially, but it, it, it quickly spread. Students erupted in anger. that These are the sort of jobs that we're going to college to be able to obtain, and now you're saying that we're only able to even compete for half the jobs. The other half are set aside for people with political connections. Um, the crisis grew, the protests grew, the government's response became increasingly heavy-handed, um, which only added fuel to the fire. Um, over 300 people have been killed, many of whom students uh, the Dhaka police simply opens fire on crowds of protesters. Uh, on August 5th, I believe, but it was the first week of August, the longtime Prime Minister, uh, Sheikh Hasina, uh, resigned and had to flee the country. Uh, she's now in exile in India. And the Nobel Peace Prize winning Mohammed Yunus, founder of the Grameen Bank, basically the, the inventor of, of microfinance, um, he has been made interim prime minister and has formed an interim government. Um, that is the very, very, very quick background. This is all available on CNN and many other platforms. What we're going to talk about is what is life and business like in Bangladesh today? So to, go, to dive right in, an open question to both of our guests, what is life like in Bangladesh right now? Is it different from Dhaka to the other cities or have things calmed down? What is daily life like uh, for, for regular people in, in Bangladesh today? To either one of our guests. Start with Sharath. Hello, John. Thank you for having me. So um, the life lately right now, um, is very unpredictable. Like, um, uh, for say the traffic control, there's no traffic police. I mean, there have been, they have been appointed, but there's been very irregularity in there. And then so talk the police, of the you're, just, you're, you're saying that the police have basically stopped showing up for work. Yeah, sure. they, no they, they were, but recently after uh, Dr. Mohammed Yunus was here, appointment, and then, um, they came to the streets, but there are there have been very in irregularity in their actions. I mean, like in some places there are, we can see them, and many places we cannot. 
and uh, that's why the streets uh, uh, they are not systematically maintained uh, lots of accidents are going on and if we talk about the schools uh, the schools have reopened but not entirely um, said like, reopened. so the schools were yeah. closed for a yeah yeah time. yeah they were closed all the primary school high school universities every every single thing would they were closed shut down for a very long period so recently uh, slowly uh, the educational system uh, institutions all of them have been reopened um, uh, students have been showing up but uh, some play, some of the universities, especially the classes, are still going online because the parents are not feeling uh, safe enough to send their uh, uh, children back to the schools. Um, and uh, for the regular people, um, I'll say uh, we are just living. Uh, we don't know what will happen. And in the meantime, there were a lot of robbery even. Uh, like um, in middle of the night, uh, this happened for more than a week, right? Uh, wow. This happened more for more than a week. So um, anything, anytime can happen. Then this happened when you know there's no there's no a government. So people do demand a government as soon as possible because that's how you know you can maintain uh, a proper a, a country can be maintained or can be country can be brought on in a systematic way sure it's just it's incredible to for especially for people who live in communities where a lack of police is almost hard to to fathom it, it's it's a basic element of 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 society that, that there has to be law and order and when <clears throat> the police just stop showing up for work uh, there's no traffic what is it what is it? as much as people might complain about getting tickets and when they when they run a traffic light you need to have the people writing tickets when when people run traffic lights if if there's no police um things don't work quite so well what about the day the daily life of businesses i mean if schools are closed the police aren't in place. I imagine people are boarding up their shops and things like that. Um, uh, upon what has the, the business impact been like? Not necessarily at the macro level, like the big manufacturers, they have security and fences and stuff like that, but people who have shops, uh, you know, sidewalk level shops, what is business like for them? Thanks again for having us, John. Well, Thanks again for having us, John. Um, from what we can see initially, uh, when there was a period where there was no government at all. So I took a few days for uh, Dr. Mohamed Yunus to fly into Bangladesh from Paris. He was in Paris for the Olympics. Uh, so in those days, uh, there was complete anarchy in Bangladesh. There was no law, there was no police. Uh, and at that time, Everything was shut down. There, all the shops scale, were boarded up. Wide uh, there was wide-scale wide scale, wide scale was vandalism and, and robbery and everywhere no because there was no accountability uh, <laughs> and no security. So, uh, for and a for a while, all uh, business were boarded up. Everything was shut down. Up. But now, things are slowly opening up. Back. Essential small services small are, are more or less all back. And small businesses are also opening up. And uh, the kind of city uh, uh, this, uh, businesses that you um, see, which you rely a lot on, let's say like away, um, uh, logistics and delivery, and like takeaway uh, services yeah, and all that, those things are all so functioning uh, as far we, as we can tell. Uh, so in that way, uh, daily life has uh, resumed. The only problem, as uh, Shurad has stated, is the irregular presence of law enforcement. And as a result, there is still, there's still a lot of uh, minor crimes, misdemeanor, misdemeanors, vandalisms, uh, and other activities going on. Uh, and also a fair amount of very um, unchecked corruption, let's say bribery and all that. That's also going on as well. Yeah, yeah, and, th and that's an interesting segue uh, upon because I was going to ask, <clears throat> and for for those listening, this is an audio only podcast, uh, but our, my my two friends with me are 
I'd guess about half my age. So uh, my our, our two guests are, are both are both young people, young professionals, young recent university grads from Bangladesh. So they they clearly have their their finger on the pulse of of the mood within that community. Um, like I said, the the protests erupted. The spark that that lit the flame was this law, this again ham-handed law setting aside 50% of government jobs for those with political connections, people involved with the leadership of, of the independence war. Um, but that those protests seem to evolve, and they evolve quickly into, as you just mentioned uh, upon, it's not just the, the police aren't showing up, it's also the corruption and the, just the naked corruption. Bangladesh, by most rankings, international rankings, is regarded as one of the one of the most corrupt countries on earth in terms of the prevalence of it how often people feel it so my question to um and i'll, I'll go to you Sharat, is is about that the the mood the the mentality within the protests they were sparked by this law um but they very quickly seem to evolve into cor corruption grievances and grievances against the uh the rule of, of, of Sheikh Hasina, um, I, I don't want to be overly political, but um, the protests went from being about one law to unleashing much broader grievances. I, am I correct in that, uh, Sharat? Uh, yes, you are correct. So it evolved very quickly. Uh, because uh, the spark of this protest is, as you say, is the Bangladesh quota system. So these uh, went back to, it started with the, uh, when Bangladesh achieved its independence in 1971. So after that, 56% uh, of uh, were man mandated to the government jobs. Uh, who were the liberation war fighters. So over the decades, this uh, was benefited to the descendants of the, to the children, grandchildren of the freedom fighters, then minorities, disabilities, all included. And then in, there was a similar student movement back in 2018. Uh, I think uh, you don't know. So this came ba back from there, from 2018. So at that time, um, uh, the, the, there the, the issue was mostly sent, uh, settled until this June 2024. Um, so in this, uh, what happened is that Bangladesh High Court uh, ruled that uh, ending the quota system was unconstitutional, uh, effectively reinstating. So after that, is the Supreme the Court, sorry to interrupt this, Shah, but is the Supreme Court in Bangladesh well regarded or is it regarded as being political? It's political. It's political. Yeah. So after that, the, when the government appealed the High Court decision, that is when the, this is what drove the students back to the street. And then in July, around 14, uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, uh, uh, in a press conference, uh, she actually, um, uh, in a press conference, said she equated the equated the protesters as Rajakars, which uh, refers to those who collaborated with the Pakistani forces to fight against the Bangladesh independence in 1971. So in response, the protesters adopted the term, like they made a um, slogan, who am I, who are you, Rajakar, Rajakar, who said that, who said that autocrat, autocrat. So autocrat, they basically called the prime minister. And that's how it's uh, evolved in this way, after, uh, so precisely after that. that. Used, used a Bangladeshi idiom, something, mm -hmm. to, a Bangla idiom, of mm. using a Rajakar, you, you're, yes, you're, yes. You're, yeah, Rajakar. You're a collaborator with the old Pakistan government. You're a collaborator. You're a traitor. But the protesters, so Sheikh Hasina used that against the protesters, who obviously have nothing to do. With yes, and it's, but it's just the a, protest, it's an insult. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. An insult. But the students have taken that. Okay, you want to use that as an insult? We'll use it as a badge. Exactly. Exactly. 
and the protesters are the students it's not like it's the students why do you do that so, uh, what are your thoughts on that? The method the, that the previous the government used, the used the previous to government set a narrative for their mandate to rule essentially comes from the independence war. Uh, as we all know that the uh, previous Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina is the daughter of Sheikh Mujib. Who is the who is the founder of the nation? He was the one who declared the initial uh, call for independence, and he's. I think everyone will agree that he is uh, identified as the father of the nation. Yeah, one of the founders of the country. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, using that ideology, uh, it, this was a very common tactic of the previous government to label all dissenting voices as uh, against the spirit of the liberation war. There are laws such as the Digital Security Act and also the parts of the Constitution, which makes any kind of uh, dissent against this quote-unquote kind of spirit of the liberation war as um, an act of uh, betrayal. Or they would, people, if anyone were to, they would be termed as traitors, exactly. So they used that tactic again, uh, and but this time it backfired really bad. And it just set a simmering flame into a complete a simmering like flame a forest into fire a and everyone like a forest fire. just and everyone they, they could not just handle they, that they not uh, handle that situation handle that, anymore uh, when everyone came out on the streets and as a result we see so many deaths so much violence Bangladesh was essentially so a war zone for two or three weeks for um, there were weeks. there were tanks rolling on the streets um, there were, there were helicopters were the shooting down people it was shooting down people it, it, it was, was a very traumatic time for the whole nation traumatic time for the whole nation yeah so if i may add so by this time this was no longer a protest among the students only yeah so grew. yeah people from all the mass people joined it it's no longer a students only uh, only a university students protest Students from high school, primary school, everyone joined. The mass people joined. Everyone joined. Because they were, um, the students were killed, especially uh, uh, the first six people who died. And uh, Abu Said from Rangpur, he was a student from um, the Rangpur University. He was unarmed and he was... Uh, uh, his arms were outreached uh, in front of the police and he was shot right there. Mm -hmm. So that's how it more escalated. And how it went from, he said it, the, it was the, a, a spark that turned into a forest fire upon, as, as you said, that it was people took to this, initially protested over this law, but deep seated grievances quickly quickly came to the forefront and when the police started shooting um it yeah it, it it became a forest fire it became a war zone a question about uh dr dr Yunus, professor Yunus. uh he's very well regarded in in western media i i only know of him what i've read uh, about him in in the, the coverage of him is basically universally positive uh, what is the the mood like that that he's back? Because he's been politically active before, but he's never held office to to my knowledge. So, is there a sense of of optimism, or is it a sense of calm? Are things starting to get better on on daily life on on the street? So, um, as we so, are a think tank, um, a think tank, uh, we do we track think tank, uh, sentiment. Think tank. Center for uh, governance. Yes, track, yes. Uh, I see yeah, sentiment. Yes. So yes, uh, as it part of our function is so, to track uh, the sentiment of part the of our function is to track the from all our data. People, we can tell that from all our data, people are very positive. Tell that and in fact, people are very positive. People want and in this fact, interim government. People want a significant majority of people want a significant majority of people under want Muhammad this Yunus to stay, to stay in power for at least five years. To stay in power for at least five years. Uh, which just is to set some uh, background, uh, uh, just there is actually some, no uh, background. There is very weak uh, there's actually no constitutional backing very weak for this government because the previous government, in an amendment, uh, 
in an the previous amendment, government had majority uh, in the parliament and the in an amendment had majority they made it the illegal and in an amendment for they made any it government any interim government an, to come to power and in terms of result uh, this power. government actually has a very uh, weak legal result, backing however there is wide as a result uh, there is popular uh, this government uh, mandate has a very for weak this government and however because there is wide it is, uh, uh, there professor is popular, uh, Muhammad Yunus mandate for this government and people are willing to support him because is, people see him uh, as non-partisan Muhammad people Yunus. see him as uh, people are willing to support him because people see an him as non-partisan the kind of uh, people the see kind him of corruption as, and also the kind uh, of politics that has Laid Bangladesh for so long, the kind of for 50 uh, years, the kind of Bangladesh and also the kind of politics that essentially has two families laid Bangladesh for in so politics long for 50 years. So, Dr. Mohammed Yunus presents an attitude to, to that, in politics. and I think most people so who Dr. want Mahabad reform presents uh, in Bangladesh, generally reform, to to that. feels like and that reform cannot come from these two families. Uh, it has to come from outside. Feels like is that reform cannot the most come from these two in that scenario. It has to come from outside. And sure, um, you're like me, an economist. Uh, you've gotten your, your bachelor's in science from economics from Bangladesh University. Uh, you're in the process of, of uh, pursuing a master's degree. Um, what exactly, just from a purely economic point of view, the Bangladesh economy has been booming. Uh, it's one of the fastest, fastest growing economies in the world over the last decade plus. A lot of people don't realize this. Bangladesh now has the highest per capita GDP in all of South Asia. Uh, Bangladesh has a higher GDP per capita than India. Now, the Gini coefficient in Bangladesh is higher. Uh, Bangladesh's income is increasingly concentrated. Uh, but still, the, the economic achievements of the country are, are, are nothing to sneeze at, to, to put it mildly. Um, what, what are the economic positions of, of Muhammad Yunus? Because he, he's known as you know, the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize winner, the humanitarian, uh, the Grameen Bank. That's what he's known for. But what are his ties with like the business community? What are his views on the economy? And, and what do you think he'll be able to get done, Shrat? Um, I think... Uh, right now, um, due to the change of the government, and right now actually there is this interim government, I think under his um, guidance, uh, the economy uh, will bloom more. And uh, I think, um, I'm sorry for the noise, there is construction outside. That's okay. That's okay. Dock is a crowded place, a lot of background noise. Uh, there's construction noises every day. Uh, so I think under his guidance, um, the businesses will uh, bloom in a uh, rapidly in a significant way. I mean gradually, but in a long-lasting way. Um, like um, starting with the grassroots level, right? At at the moment, uh, the price of the daily necessities are quite high. So I think. Um, this will start from there, like uh, the general people, they can buy um, the basic necessities at least. Uh, not uh, there, because uh, in the last uh, government's regime, the price of the daily necessities, there were the inflation. Uh, so uh, I think under uh, what I expect that under his uh, guidance, under his rule, uh, this inflation will come down and people, the general people, will actually be able to buy the ne daily necessities in a very reasonable prices. Actually, the, they, at the actual prices they can buy. Uh, for, say, if I say an example like the, the, the very general people, they mostly say that they cannot buy our national uh, fish. Oh, because it's very high price. It's been a long time that they have not been able to buy and eat it. So it's just an example. So I think that the daily necessity, the price of the daily necessities will come down. When that's how I think the economy can bloom rapidly. Yeah, that makes and that makes sense. And I misspoke earlier. I apologize, Sharat. You are not pursuing a master's degree in economics. You have yeah. a master's degree in economics. I, I misspoke. I apologize. Okay. 
Uh, we're coming up on the end of the conversation. So my last question is going to be to Afon. Uh, Sherrod is an economist. Uh, you're, you, by background, are a journalist. Um, and so as a journalist, uh, what is, if you had a crystal ball and what you could see into the future, what's going to come next in Bangladesh in terms of Bangladesh politics? As Sherrod said, Bangladeshi politics have been dominated by two families, by two specific women for as the last quarter century or so. So if you had a crystal ball upon, what would it be telling you? Well, the, the political scenario in Bangladesh is very um, unstable at the moment. One party, the Awami League, who was essentially the most powerful political party or political entity in Bangladesh has essentially collapsed. Uh, their, their party infrastructure has collapsed. I don't think they even have an office anymore. It was all of them were burned down by angry mobs. So literally, literally they were all the, all the Awami League offices were literally burned to the ground. Literally by the, burned by to the ground by angry mobs. Uh, so this is a this is a unique situation in Bangladesh where the most prominent and powerful political entity just disappeared overnight, leaving a huge power vacuum in the Bangladesh social political landscape. Uh, we can try to analyze the scenario as like a left versus right kind of uh, perspective, even though that may not apply directly in the context of Bangladesh, but Aum League did re represent the, the center left of Bangladesh. They were the party of progressives, of secularism and all that. So there's, a, there's now an international fear that uh, with the absence of this center-left party who were prominent for keeping the extreme right in check in Bangladesh. There is now the fear that, that the extreme right voices will now have more, uh, they will have more uh, political power and more, a more vocal presence in the politics of Bangladesh. And as a result, Bangladesh might turn more, uh, more towards uh, a right position, a religious uh, fundamentalist mm. position. I was going to ask you, and by, by right in Bangladeshi politics, that refers to uh, religiously conservative, more Islamic, Absolutely. Islamist, I'm sorry, Islamist parties. Yes, the Islamist parties. And we can see that uh, currently the Islamist parties are rallying, like they have so much because of the newfound uh, freedom of speech because they're no longer disappeared for talking against the government, they are now rallying and they have the support base for that have been uh, suppressed for so long. They are now coming out, they're speaking, they're holding rallies uh, and they are playing, they're playing some key roles in trying to keep Bangladesh stable as well. As a result, their popularity is increasing over time. So, uh, from my understanding and from my opinion, I guess, we will see a more prominent uh, uh, right, Islamic right uh, voice in the politics of Bangladesh going forward. And, um, but however, the, over time, perhaps a new party may try to replace Aum League, or maybe Aum League will come back uh, after some rehabilitation has taken place after the proper justice has been met. Uh, lots of cases are being filed and all, essentially all prominent um, figureheads of Aum League have uh, left the, either left the country or are in prison. Uh, so after that whole justice system has met the proper trials against the, the people who are responsible, perhaps the party can come back and maybe they may have a voice, but people are against that as well. Lots of people are saying that uh, Aum League as a party should just be banned uh, and they should have no space in politics anymore in Bangladesh because, because of what happened. As a result... Uh, oh, please continue, sorry. Uh, yeah. So uh, right now I think it's way too early to tell, but all I can say is that uh, I think the, the right-wing voices will have more space now. It's interesting upon, uh, you described that the Uwami League um, was 
initially it was a, a center-left government. It, in, in fact, its history it had a background with, with it was considered left. Uh, but the Awami League ha hasn't really had much, at least as it's been viewed by the outside world. And this is what we'll wrap up with. Sipe talks a lot about the, the need for strong institutions. Uh, it was President Barack Obama used the term. He was in Africa at the time, but he said, uh, this continent needs strong institutions, not strong men. The, the Awami League started as it, it had ideology, but it became, it was an instrument around one family, in particular, one person, uh, one, one the, the, the prime minister in charge. And as a result, this all-powerful institution that was viewed as the, the power that ran the government, when stress was applied to it, it proved remarkably brittle. Uh, and the Awami League could, as you say, it could cease to exist. That, con that constituency, the center-left constituency is still there, but the institution itself proved to be quite brittle. Uh, and Bangladesh needs strong institutions, not not strong men or, or strong bagoons to, to battle. So, absolutely. Uh, Sharat Rana, Rushmi, and Aponsa here, thank you so much for taking the time to, to see us. And please stay safe. And thank you for being so willing to share what are difficult things to share. Bangladesh is going through a crisis right now, but at least I think our, our friends, both talented young professionals, these are the people who will be the backbone of the future Bangladesh. The fact that under uh, Professor Yunus's leadership, there is a sense of optimism. That sense of optimism is returning. And so those of us who may not be in Bangladesh today, whether we're in the United States or anywhere else, you give us reason for optimism as well. So thank you both so much for your time. We hope to have you back sometime soon. Thank you for having us. Listen and subscribe to Sipes Democracy That Delivers wherever you get your podcasts.